and these are in listen only mode. Welcome to the American Indian and Alaska Native Behavioral Health Webinar Series presented by the National American Indian and Alaska Native Addiction Technology Transfer Center. I'm Karen Summers and I'll be administering today's webinar. Today, Becky Tussing will be presenting techniques used in combating prescription drug abuse in the QNE or QENA Bay Indian community. This training series is brought to you by the National American Indian and Alaska Native Addiction Technology Transfer Center, or ATTC. The National American Indian and Alaska Native ATTC is one of four national focus centers which serves the ATTC network. The ATTC network is a nationwide network made up of 10 regional centers, four national focus centers, and a network coordinating office. The map on this slide shows you the states served by each of the regional ATTCs. To learn more about our center or the network, or your regional center, please visit our website. Our next webinar in this series is scheduled for Wednesday, January 8th from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Time, where Aaron Bailey and Josie Raffaelito from the Center for Native American Youth at the Aspen Institute will be presenting Bereavement and Grief, What Are the Resources Related to Native American Youth? In addition to this webinar series, we offer another series titled the Essential Substance Abuse Skills Webinar Series, which provides an overview of competencies from CSAT's TAP 21 publication, Addiction Counseling Competencies. The next session in our Essential Substance Abuse Skills Series will be held on December 18th from 1 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time, where Robert Foley, former president of the National Native American AIDS Prevention Center, will prevent on client, family, and community education. For more information on our webinar series, you can contact Kate Thrams at the email address or phone number provided on this slide. Our center is a NADAC certified educational provider and we'd be happy to provide you with CEUs. The cost is $10 to do so. The CEU request form, along with a copy of the PowerPoint, will be sent to you within 24 hours of today's session. If you don't receive the email with the handouts within two business days, <clears throat> please let us know. In addition to the PowerPoint handout and CEU request form, a link to our GIPRA evaluation will be included in the email you receive following today's webinar. We invite you to participate in this brief online customer survey. The survey asks you about your satisfaction with the event and will take less than 10 minutes to complete. GIPRA stands for the Government Performance and Results Act, and SAMHSA asks us to evaluate our events in order to comply with this act and provide improved performance assessment and accountability. SAMHSA uses information collected by these surveys to determine how many people have attended our events, your satisfaction with our events, and how useful our events are to you. We hope you'll assist us in gathering information about our series by participating in our evaluation. Before we start today's session, I'd like to give you a quick overview of the GoToWebinar system. To hide or expand your toolbar at any time, you can click on the red arrow in the top right-hand side of your window. To expand your screen, click the middle button in the top right-hand corner. You will be muted for the duration of this webinar. Please use the question chat box to share your questions and comments. Your questions will be only visible to me, the webinar moderator. I'll pass your questions along to the presenter at appropriate points in the presentation. We would also like you to be aware that this webinar records participant attention time. If you minimize the webinar or are working in another window, the system will record your participation as an active, which may be reflected in the number of CEUs received. The opinions expressed in this presentation are those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the official present position of CSAT, SAMHSA, or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Today's webinar is presented by Becky Tussing. Becky is a registered member of the Kiwina Bay Indian Community and is the Associate Director of the Kiwina Bay Indian Community Department of Health and Human Services. Please join me in welcoming Becky Tussing. Hello, my name is Becky Tussing. Um, as Karen had mentioned, my name, um, I am a member of the Kuna Bay Indian Community. 
and I, my background is in nursing. I am a registered nurse. Um, I have been employed by the Cuna Bay Indian Community Department of Health and Human Services for the past 15 years. I work directly with patient care from 1998 to 2007, um, basically working with our family practice physicians and most recently in administration. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us for this presentation this afternoon. And I will go ahead and get started. Um, I am located, our department is located in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan along the beautiful shores of Cuna Bay. Reservation land is located in Berger County and in Marquette County. The total membership of the Cuna Bay Indian community is approximately 3,552 members with 944 members living on reservation land. Um, the Department of Health and Human Services is funded by Indian Health Service. Um, as you can see on this map here, our contract health service delivery area is Berga, Holton, and Ontnogin County. The economy of the area is very tenuous. Michigan historically has had one of the highest unemployment rates of the nation, and Berga has consistently ranked highest in the state, and recently again was also rated highest in the state. The scope of the problem at the Cuna Bay Indian community. Um, in 2007 and 2008, Berger County had more than twice the amount of controlled substance prescriptions per person of the most dangerous prescription drugs such as Oxycontin and Hydrocodone, which is more than Mar Marquette County and nearly four times that of Ontnogin County. The average amount of prescriptions in Berger County is 4.5 per person, two more than Houghton County at 2.5, and substantially higher than Marquette and Ontnogging County. In looking at those numbers, one thing I would like to point out is that Berger County also has the lowest um, population of the surrounding counties. Um, according to the 2000 census data, the um, population of Berger County at the time that this report was done was approximately 8,000 people. The population of Houghton County was about 36,000 people and 50-some thousand people in Marquette County. So it was rather alarming to see the amount of controlled substances per person in Berger County. Um, to back up on that information that I just presented, I'd like to share how I obtained that information. Um, back in 2006, 2007, I had met with a um, medical supply representative from Lower Michigan who stopped by my office to show me a random drug screen kit that could be used to test for um, drugs of abuse. And when I met with her, she showed me some information showing the amount of controlled substances per person um, in, in Lower Michigan. And this, this information was obtained from the Michigan Automated Prescription Service. Um, formerly known as MAPS. And the state of Michigan does track the amount of controlled substances by zip code. Um, and for many, many, many years I had heard that um, the amount of controlled substances in Bexar County had been higher. And I thought, you know, boy, we really need to look at that. I didn't really think that um, after working in Bexar County for so long that our rates would be really any higher than any other physician's office in the area or surrounding counties. Um, I had worked with Stephanie Pinot. Stephanie and was our contract epidemiologist at that time, and we had gotten the data from the state of Michigan and started compiling that by zip code. And it was rather alarming when we got this data, and we felt that it was really important that we share this with the surrounding physicians' offices. Um, at that time, it had really um, acquired a substantial amount of attention from the local hospitals, law enforcement, and whatnot. And that's when we really started to realize the scope of the problem. During 2011, the Cuna Bay Indian Community Tribal Police had responded to 27 domestic violence dispute calls, 17 drug abuse calls, 22 assaults, 60 larcenies, 4 sex offenses, 14 burglaries, and 10 child abuse calls. It is unknown how many of those calls involved alcohol or drugs, but it seemed to be the major contributing factor to crime rates throughout the country. Over the last year, child abuse calls increased by 900%, burglaries by 55%, 
domestic violence and dispute calls by 35%, and assaults by 10%. In 2006, the Cunabay Indian Community Tribal Council formed the KBIC Drug Task Force. And what this is, is there's members from the KBIC Health Department, Tribal Police, the Tribal Wellness Court, Tribal Housing and Social Services, Tribal Council, and our outpatient treatment facility. And basically what this was is getting the major stakeholders within the tribal community to get together to talk about the scope of the problem that our community was facing. The KBIC Drug Task Force mission statement is to promote education through public awareness with a specific objective to eliminate the use of illegal drugs for the betterment of the health, welfare, and safety of the Cuna Bay Indian community and our neighboring communities. And I will say at the beginning of, of getting together um, with the start of the KBIC Drug Task Force, it, it was rather, um, it, it, it was a rather tense um, environment. You know, it, I think everybody came to the table presenting with different perspectives on what the problem was that we were facing, particularly with prescription drugs. And I think there, in the beginning there may have been a mindset of, you know, well, why are the doctors prescribing? And then, you know, from the medical community, well, why aren't the people being in, um, incarcerated or why aren't they in jail or why aren't they in treatment but in working together we all realized that it was real important we were on the same page and we actually developed a very good working relationship in which we could meet monthly talk about current issues um, law enforcement could share information about the amount of arrests um, drug related crimes and from the health department we did not share any confidential information but sometimes the information that we could get from you know, the, the tribal police or from the judge, we could bring back to the health center. Some things that the Cuna Bay Indian Community Department in Health and Human Services has implemented um, are listed here. Um, we've had a prescription drug abuse contract or policy since 2003. Um, we have since had to implement direct observation random drug screens for patients that are on controlled substances. Um, it was brought to our attention that sometimes patients were bringing in urine from other, from somebody that could test clean or somebody that was actually taking a controlled substance if they were if the drug was being diverted. Um, we've implemented a um, plan do study act of quality improvement for controlled substance refills, looking at the amount of time that is spent on our staff processing these refill requests, making sure that patients are coming in for random drug tests, pill counts, etc. Um, we utilize the Michigan Automated Prescription Service to look at the um, prescribing history or the history of patients that are coming in new on controlled substances, and we've also looked at the prescribing history of our physicians. Um, we've implemented case management meetings um, and a multidisciplinary approach involving our neuropsychologists, um, some of our staff that have um, history with working with patients with dependency. Um, we've also worked with the KBIC Wellness Court to develop a medically assisted treatment protocol for patients that are in Wellness Court. We also have a referral network for outpatient substance abuse evaluation with the Access to Recovery Program. The KBIC Tribal Council um, approved many years ago an abusive behavior policy. And this is something that administration is very good about upholding. Um, if patients come in and they're upset, if perhaps maybe they can't get a refill on a controlled substance because they violated the policy. Um, there's strong administrative support, as I had mentioned, for our medical staff. And um, the tribe in general has developed a drug tip line where people can call and leave anonymous tips if they know that there's some illegal behavior that is, or illegal activity that is happening. Some other resources that the tribe also has, um, the KBIC Tribal Police has a canine dog, um, received some grant funding to fund a meth officer. The Cuna Bay Indian Community does have a residential treatment center, New Day Treatment Center. There's also outpatient treatment um, funded by Access to Recovery and also there's other, some other funding available for that. Transitional housing, on staff neuropsychologists, as I mentioned earlier, medically assisted treatment with Vivitrol. Um, for those of you that do not know what Vivitrol is, it is a non-controlled um, injectable medication that helps patients with opioid or narcotic addiction and alcohol addiction. 
there's the KBIC Wellness Court, um, Ojibwa Housing, and there's also job development and job training for community members. Michigan law um, have went into effect a couple years ago that makes it criminal to obtain or attempt to obtain a controlled substance or a prescription for a controlled substance by fraud from a health care provider. The statute also says that medical records or information released for those patients who do, are not protected by the physician-patient privilege, dentist-patient privilege, or any other health professional patient privilege created or recognized by law. This was really um, a very wonderful law that had went into effect for our department because many times we would come across um, in running a MAPS report or a prescribing history for patients and see that they had been to many different physicians obtaining the same prescription. And, you know, knowing that patients were going ahead and obtaining these prescriptions and many of our health staff felt like they really could not do anything about that. Um, and we're very fortunate that our tribe had also took this law and then put this into tribal code, you know, upholding that same, that same law stating any person who should do any act or who shall fail to do any act involving a substance defined as a controlled substance by the Michigan Controlled Substance Act shall be guilty of a misdemeanor if such act or omission shall occur within the jurisdiction of tribal court. A conviction upon violation of the provisions of this section shall constitute a conviction of a Class B misdemeanor. And above here are some examples of um, criminal conduct that could be considered a scenario of um, simultaneously obtaining controlled substance from more than one physician, getting a controlled substance prescription for the same condition from more than one provider, getting a controlled substance in someone else's name, using altering or falsified information to get a controlled substance, and filling the same substance prescription at more than one pharmacy. Um, with this, it's, we're considering revising our controlled substance policy and requiring that it's reported to law enforcement, but our medical staff have, have had some mixed feelings on that. Um, this goes into the HIPAA aspect of this or the patient confidentiality. Healthcare providers may disclose protected health information when that information contains what the provider believes is evidence of a crime committed on the healthcare facility's premises. Mm -hmm and then it lists the Code of Federal Regulations supporting this. Information regarding fraudulently obtaining or attempting to obtain a controlled substance by fraud is evidence of a crime committed on the premises of the healthcare facility. In 2009 and 2010, in an effort to address the substance abuse problem in the Cuna Bay Indian community, research into various grants had begun. Through a community-wide effort in February 2011, the KBIC Health Healing and Wellness Court was created. Drug courts ensure compliance. Fact, unless substance abusing addicted offenders are regularly supervised and held accountable, 70% will drop out of treatment prematurely. Drug courts are six times more likely to keep offenders in treatment long enough for, for them to get better. Nationwide, 75% of drug court graduates remain arrest-free for at least two years after leaving the program. Rigorous studies examining long-term outcomes of individual drug courts have found that reductions in crime last at least three years and can endure for over 14 years. The most rigorous and conservative scientific meta-analysis have all concluded that drug courts significantly reduce crime as much as 45% more than other programs. How does the KBIC drug or wellness court work? And this, this process starts with a team. A diverse team of individuals include a court advocate, prosecutor, police commissioner, probation officer, healing and wellness coordinator, police officer, psychologist, and judge. All members of this team have a final say in the decision that is made. Accountability, honesty, caring, and change. In conjunction with the medical and mental health consultations such as Vivitrol, mental health counseling, outpatient treatment, clients work through four, process, through four phases. Phase one is stabilization and treatment. 
and this may last approximately 60 days. Participants must attend at least two support network meetings, such as AA, NA, Smart Recovery, follow all aftercare treatment plans as recommended by the treatment provider, follow a curfew, and report to the drug co coordinator twice a week. Drug test twice a week plus random drug testing. Submit to court-ordered mental health counseling recommendations. Be subject to random home visits, which include searches and drug tests. Attend academy psychology positive peer culture groups and remain clean for 30 consecutive days before participants can move to phase two. Phase two, healthy living. Meet with drug court coordinator once per week. Drug test once a week plus random testing. Be subject to random home visits. Continue participation in a treatment plan. Become employment ready. Participate in community service. Participate in three su support network meetings and academy psychology positive peer culture. And remain clean for 60 days prior to moving to phase three. Phase three, giving back to the community. Drug court coordinator office visits two times a month, random home visits, drug tests two times a month in addition to random testing, participate in educational and vocational GED training as necessary, community service, participate in at least three support network meetings and academy psychology positive peer culture, and develop a recovery plan implement a healthy living plan and submit a written narrative describing lifestyle changes. 60 consecutive clean days are required to move to the final phase, phase four. In this phase, participants attend in court review hearings once a month, participate in a treatment plan, have um, drug court coordinator office visits once a month, random home visits, drug testing monthly, no new criminal involvement, and follow all previous court orders. In this final phase, become employment ready with resumes, interviewing skills, and additional educational vocational GED training as necessary, and then graduation. Here are pictured some of the wellness court participants and activities. And that the participants in the wellness court have really been um, quite, quite bonding and had some successful um, graduations. Um, I've listed some of my reference here, references here, and um, I'm ready if anybody has any questions. Thank you, Becky. Um, so it looks like our first question is, for the tribal code, do any act or fail to do any act? What does that mean? Any fail or any act. Let me go back to, so I can understand what the question is. who shall fail to do any act involving a substance defined as a controlled substance by the Michigan Controlled Substance Act shall be guilty of a misdemeanor if such act or omission shall occur within the jurisdiction of this court. I think that would be um, perhaps not reporting if they are um, trying to obtain a controlled substance from more than one provider. I guess I didn't really read it that way. Um, any person who shall do any act or shall fail to do any act involving a substance defined as a controlled substance by Michigan. I, you know, I know that the language is really kind of boiling down to willingly um, manipulating the system, the healthcare system, into you know getting a controlled substance from more than one provider, and that was the biggest issue that we had seen here within our community is that. 
Um, many times a patient would come to our office to obtain a controlled substance for chronic pain and at the same time go to another provider to receive the same controlled substance. Um, our, our policy here is that we require that patients will sign an agreement stating that they will not receive medications at more than one pharmacy and they will not attempt to go to another physician to obtain the same prescription. Thank you. Um, oh, we've got a little bit of a, oh, yep. So the person you'd asked that says that they were wondering what types of acts that might involve and they think you answered it. So thank you. Okay. Um, our next question is, um, do you have any recommendations for communities who are looking to establish similar collaborations um, to the collaborations that your community established? I think um, information sharing with the tribal council about the, the importance of the issue. And I know that our council was very aware of, of many of the many of the issues related in particular to prescription drug abuse. Um, when we gathered the data from the Michigan Automated Prescription Service, we did bring that forward to our, forth to our tribal council. Um, the KDIC Drug Task Force had been already formed prior to that. Um, but I think it's important that the, the council is aware of the issues that health, law enforcement, tribal courts are dealing with. And we're, we're seeing now that on the county level that Bear County in general is trying really to kind of form a similar working relationship with law enforcement and the medical community and the treatment community. Um, we feel that it was very beneficial here. We had a much better working relationship and I think that was one of the, one of the starting blocks into being able to have a real effective team. And our tribal court has been very successful in implementing the wellness court. Um, we have a very good working relationship between the health department and the wellness court coordinator and making sure that um, plans of care are followed through. You know, when patients are scheduled to come in for a Vivintrol injection, that they get in for their appointment. They're having follow-up with outpatient counseling. Um, they're not having any side effects or any, any difficulties with the medically assisted treatment. Um, and it's just, it, it's been a really wonderful program to see in play. Thank you. Our next question is, is this primarily for prescription drug abuse or can it include meth as well? We have a big problem with both. Thanks. We haven't, um, I, I know that there has been some meth in the area. I'm not sure that it's really been as big of a problem as prescription drug abuse has. Um, so I, I really can't speak to having any expertise in, in dealing with meth addiction or anything like that. Um, I think historically in some of the evidence that I've read that when you see that the rates of prescription drug abuse will decline, that sometimes you'll see meth rates start going up. Thank you. Um, our next question is, have you seen any... Um, drops in your numbers of prescription drug abuse after establishing the task force and the wellness courts? <clears throat> you know, um, we started looking at the data again a couple years ago and we had some difficulty in extracting the amount of data that we got from the Michigan Automated Prescription Service. I don't know that we've really seen um, a drop in, in the rate of prescription drug abuse. Um, we do track, you know, how many prescriptions are dispensed from our own pharmacy, and, and we continually meet um, on a multidisciplinary level to look at how we can, you know, make some changes or update our prescription drug abuse policy. So I, I think on the bigger picture is looking at maybe how to start intervening on patients that are starting to develop some patterns of abuse. You know, that's been a very difficult thing for us as well you know, er, requests for early medication refills, um, failed random drug screens um, with, you know, more than drugs that are just prescribed, like THC, marijuana, things like that. Thank you. If anyone else has a question at this time, um, you can go ahead and type it in that chat box.
Um, we do have a few questions about um, being able to get the PowerPoint handout, and we will have that available to you. Um, that will go out in an email following today's webinar, so you'll have PowerPoint handouts of all the slides. Um, so our next question is, is Native spirituality incorporated in any way as a protective factor? As a protective factor, I know that the, the Positive Peer Culture Group is, is um, involved with making sure that there's culturally appropriate um, information and resources that are available for the Wellness Court Coordinator. Um, currently, within our department, we're looking at trying to expand services to include our tra the traditional healer and even just primary care at our facility, and that's something that we're currently working on. Great. Um, and the next question is, is the Vivitrol similar to Suboxone? No, and I probably should have talked a little bit more about Vivitrol and, and how it's really been very instrumental in, in helping with Wellness Court. Um, Vivitrol is not a controlled substance. It's actually an injectable form of oral naltrexone that was used years ago primarily for alcohol addiction. And what happens with Vivitrol is um, it's a once a month it's a once a month injection, and it blocks the receptors in the brain, so that if somebody is using something like um, hydrocodone, they do not get the euphoria or the the high from using that medication, and it helps it helps to kind of really stop those cravings. Um, there is, of course, the, the potential that somebody could try to override the effect of Vivitrol and overdose by taking too much of a controlled substance. And Vivitrol is not intended to be used as just the primary means of treatment, but it should be used in conjunction with outpatient counseling, substance abuse counseling, and follow-up. But um, we also had very, we had concerns with Subutex or Subaxone because we had heard stories of the medication being misused. So it's not something that our physicians prescribe or that our pharmacy will even dispense. And family practice physicians do not need to have an extra certification or licensure to, to prescribe Vivitrol. Okay. Um, we have kind of a follow-up question to that. Um, so does it have the withdrawal like Suboxone if a person is on it longer term? No. And, and typically treatment can be up to about a year with Vivitrol. Um, we've had some of our wellness courts participants um, talk about the, you know, having tried different um, modalities for treatment and actually really talked about how Vivitrol kind of provide that, provided that assurance of knowing that the cravings weren't going to come and they weren't going to want to use when they were using the other aspects of say, that wellness court helped to provide with the you know, job training, life training, counseling, um, positive culture group, you know, things like that. Right. And the nice thing with Vivitrol, and our neuropsychologists have talked a bit about this, is that um, you know oral naltrexone can also be effective, but it's only effective if somebody's taking their medications on a daily basis. Coming in once a month to get the injection is going to give you about a month of a month of um, medication in one shot. It is rather pricey. We did have um, some difficulties in working with Medicaid to make sure that our patients that had insurance coverage, that we were getting proper reimbursement. Um, just a couple stumbling blocks in the beginning, but then we were able to get reimbursed for those patients that have insurance. Great. Thank you. Um, so our next question is, can you provide more explanation about the positive peer group? How is it organized and who facilitates it? Is there a specific format? You know, I really don't have more information that I can provide for that. I can contact the KBIC Wellness Court, um, who facilitates, who works with um, Mark Pantanovich with that to get more information out, though. Thank you. Um, so our next question is, um, do you have any IHS treatment 
facilities in your vicinity for prescription drug abuse or for drug and alcohol abuse? We do. Um, we our, The CUNY Bay Indian community does receive funding for a residential treatment center that is called the New Day Treatment Center. Um, and it, it is a 28-day treatment facility and patients that do have prescription drug abuse issues do receive treatment at that facility. Um, our next question goes back to the Vivitrol. Uh, do you know of an average length time that people may be recommended on Suboxone? Okay, um, and Suboxone, we do not prescribe Suboxone or Subutex, so I, I certainly wouldn't really be able to adequately provide any information about that. Um, Vivitrol, as I had mentioned, can be up to a year um, of the monthly injection. Thank you. Uh, does Vivitol have a street value? No, it's it's not a controlled substance, um, so it's it's not even dispensed um, to people to take out of our facility. Um, it's dispensed from our pharmacy directly to our nursing staff who administer the injection while patients are in to see the physician. Thank you. So you'd mentioned, our next question is, you mentioned earlier um, some conflict between um, some of the medical community and um, determining what information could be released to the Justice Department. Um, mm -hmm. how, how did you deal with that, that conflict or come to, come to an agreement there? We don't. We don't. Re we didn't release any information at drug task force meetings on patient information or um, anything like that at the meeting. You know, um, as I had mentioned, though, one thing I think that was most beneficial in having those monthly meetings is oftentimes when patients would come in to see the physician, they could be drug seeking and you know falsely stating, oh, I have chronic back pain, blah blah blah. Meanwhile, they've had a history of an arrest for possession of narcotics from another physician or maybe they didn't have a prescription for it or maybe they had been um, prosecuted for selling narcotics. Um, and many times our, our facility or I think even in general, the medical community may not have access to that information unless you're looking at a public court report. So it was very helpful for tribal court and the tribal police department to kind of release or on an ongoing basis share the information with our department. Mm on public arrest related to narcotics. Thank you. Time for a few more questions, if anyone else has anything else that they'd like to enter in that chat box. Okay, our next question is, when you started the task force, um, were certain partners on board earlier than others, or did you have to build, build the partners over time? You know, I think um, we have a rather small community, and it was, the, it was our tribal council that had formed the, the drug task force out of concerns for the, the prevalence of abuse that we had seen in the community. And I think that um, very most most people working or a department had had a, a very strong desire to want to work together or to want to do something about it. 
So um, from the beginning, I think there there was automatic involvement or want to be involved from from tribal police, tribal courts, the health departments, social services, and housing. Thank you. Okay, our next question is: Can you get an extension on the one-year limit with Vivitrol? Um, I think that's based on a, a physician decision whether or not um, people are progressing or are able to come off of Vivitrol, and obviously people may have relapses during the course of treatment. So I think that's really based on a physician judgment of appropriateness to continue with the treatment plan. And our next question is, is there physician training required to prescribe Vivitrol? There is not um, physician training that is required. We did work with um, Alchemies, which is the company that um, provides Vivitrol, to have um, education. And we also included um, substance abuse counselors from the treatment field and even um, participants from tribal court or you know the wellness court employees to come in so that we could sit down and have discussion and, and learn more about the, the medication because when we started it, it was still fairly new on the market. Mm. Um, is there a generic Vivitrol? The generic form of Vivitrol is oral naltrexone and it is in a pill format. But the injectable medication itself is is not generic. All right. Well, if there aren't any more questions, I think we can go ahead and wrap up. So once again, I'd like to thank Becky for sharing her knowledge with us today. Um, and thank all of you for taking time out of your schedule to be here. We do ask that you watch for our email with the handouts for this webinar. So attachments to that email will include your CEU request form, the PowerPoint handout, and a link to our customer satisfaction survey. We appreciate um, should you decide to participate in that survey as completion of these surveys allows us to show SAMHSA the number of people served by our webinar. To participate in the GIPRA evaluation, simply follow the link in the email. We hope that you'll be able to join us for the next webinar in our series, Bereavement and Grief, What are the Resources Related to Native American Youth? On January 8th with Aaron Bailey and Josie Raffaelito from the Center for Native American Youth with the Aspen Institute. We hope you'll be able to join us for our next webinar in our Essential Substance Abuse webinar series on December 18th, where Robert Foley, former president of the National Native American AIDS Prevention Center, will be presenting on client, family, and community education. So once again, thank you for your time participating in today's session. We hope you've enjoyed the session, and we look forward to hearing your feedback. Thank you. Thank you.